been called the worst director of all time, certainly one of the most eccentric. Edward D. Wood Jr. He was a rebel who made movies in Hollywood, but outside of the Hollywood filmmaking establishment. He independently produced his own movies, wrote, directed, and sometimes even starred in them. He worked super fast and super cheap, resulting in some of the so-called worst movies ever made. He's done westerns, crime dramas, but we're going to focus on his horror movies. It's Cinemassacre's Ed wood a thon a two-part retrospective. First on our list is Glenner Glenda from 1953. No, it's not exactly a horror movie, but it's so fucked up you might as well call it one. It was produced by George Weiss with original intentions to make a biopic about Christine Jorgensen, a woman who was originally a man, the first publicly known sex change. Ed Wood was hired to write and direct, but completely changed the whole idea, making it a semi-autobiography about himself and his desire to dress in women's clothes. He stars in the movie under the name Daniel Davis. He was able to cast his idol, horror star Bela Lugosi, whose name is synonymous with Dracula. At this time, unfortunately, he was addicted to morphine and his career was in the gutter, but Ed Wood managed to get him back on the screen. He's even top billed. But his way of utilizing him is totally bizarre, but brilliant at the same time. Basically, he sort of plays a godlike character who narrates what's going on while mixing together test tubes and surrounded by skeletons. So this means that Lugosi is seen and heard throughout a good portion of the film, even though we have no idea what purpose he has there. And all they needed to do was just film him one time sitting in a chair. For that, it was practical and kind of clever. However, the narration he's given makes no sense. Beware of the big green dragon that sits on your doorstep. Puppy duck tails and big fat snails. Pull the string! Pull the string! Pull the strings? Beware the big green dragon and speaking in nursery rhymes intercut with stock footage of bison? But Lugosi does his usual fine job delivering these ridiculous and cryptic lines. But the strangest part of all is a 15 minute nightmare scene involving a devil, random people acting like idiots, a woman being whipped on a couch, and very bizarre striptease dances, all cut to reaction shots of Lugosi and Ed Wood. The whole movie has strange use of stock footage, strange use of voiceovers, it begins like a documentary depicting cultural deviance, sort of becomes a horror movie, an experimental art film, an auto-bio, a bondage movie, and then it ends with a sex change. What the fuck kind of twisted piece of crap is this? But at least it succeeds in telling a story. What Ed Wood made was a very personal and bold movie asking the world to accept those who deviate from the norm. Even though it's a totally disjointed mess, it could easily pass as an art house film. Believe me, in that category, I have seen worse. The rating seems pointless, but from a general standpoint, I give it one puppy dog tail out of five. But for ambition, it gets at least three. Next up, Bride of the Monster from 1956. This was Ed Wood's first monster movie. It begins with a stormy credit sequence with a scary old house. Classic. Bela Lugosi stars as a mad scientist, Dr. Vornoff, who's experimenting with atomic rays to create an army of mutant men to take over the world. It's as cliche as it gets. It's Lugosi's last speaking role, and he at least has a lot of lines. I will perfect my own race of people. A race of atomic supermen which will conquer the world. <laughs> There's also a moment where he does this weird hypnosis thing with his hands, which is a tribute to White Zombie, which obviously Ed Wood was a fan of. He has a lab assistant named Lobo, played by Swedish wrestler Tor Johnson, who spends the whole time lumbering around, grunting, and taking plenty of abuse from Lugosi. The protagonist and all supporting actors are real boring, but there's the silly cop Kelton, yes, played by Paul Marco, who says, yes sir, constantly. Yes sir. There's two particular sets that are kind of interesting. There's a laboratory set, which is extremely cheap by most standards, and there's a dark room in the house, which has a crooked picture frame in the background and a staircase leading to nowhere. It resembles the German expressionist classic, The Cabin of Dr. Caligari. But how about the monster? Well, the poster shows Lugosi, making it seem that he's the monster. Also, you can say Lobo's the monster, but then there's the octopus. The doctor keeps it in a large tank, which is actually a lake. 
You see stock footage of a real octopus underwater cut to a fake rubber octopus attacking people. First of all, the two shots don't even match at all. And the rubber octopus doesn't even move. The actors are doing all the work. So it's one of the worst monsters ever seen. But let's cut to the chase. There's some intervention from the male and female protagonist. Lobo turns against his master, straps him to the table, turns the ray on him. The doctor mutates into a monster, which basically means he covers his face and acts like he's a monster. He gets into a fight with Lobo, breaking bottles and pushing each other around. Watch the wall shake as Lobo backs into it. Even if it fell down, Ed Wood's the kind of guy who would just roll with it. Lobo backs up into the machinery and then something next to him explodes. The whole house catches fire. The police shoot at Varnoff who deflects the bullets by making ridiculous faces. Then they roll a boulder and they send him into a lake where he's attacked by his own octopus and then struck by lightning which causes an atomic explosion. Wow. Overall, it's the lowest grade monster movie ever possible, but it's hilarious and Lugosi makes it worthwhile. My rating, two and a half octopuses. Next came the film that Ed Wood is known for, Plan 9 from Outer Space. It has a reputation as the worst movie of all time, but let's see if that's fair. The plot involves aliens who try to take over the world by resurrecting the Earth's dead, but they only resurrect three zombies and that's it. One is played by TV horror hostess Vampira. She looks pretty creepy and she kills people by wiggling her fingers. The second ghoul is supposed to be Bela Lugosi, even though Lugosi had passed away before the movie was made. Before, Ed Wood shot silent footage of Lugosi wandering around in a cemetery in his Dracula cape, originally intended for another film. He incorporated these shots into Plan 9 and then he got his wife's chiropractor to fill in the role by covering his face with the cape. Even though his true identity is concealed and credited as Bela Lugosi in his final film, you can still tell that he's taller and he looks nothing like him. Watch this. Here you have the real Lugosi, real cemetery at daylight. Cut to fake Lugosi, fake cemetery at night. It might be the most bewildering contrast of bad juxtaposition ever in a film. There's also a scene where he's attacking someone and he stops to adjust his cape. Not to mention, constantly covering your face with a cape is not scary, and it's super cliche. Even Abbott and Costello made fun of that sort of thing in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, and that was almost 10 years before Plan 9 was released. Then there's Tor Johnson playing a police officer who can't act for the love of fuck. Okay, Inspector, what are you going to do? Look around that little. <laughs> what did he say? So of course he gets killed by the two ghouls because they're both standing on opposite sides of him. Clearly there's no other direction he could possibly run, and what they do to him isn't even clear. He comes back as the third and last zombie, which is hysterical because he gets stuck trying to come out of the grave. His face became a popular Halloween mask. How flattering. He also knocks people out by slapping them on their shoulders. The movie begins with an introduction by psychic Criswell, and it makes no sense at all. Future events such as these will affect you in the future. He also narrates over most of the movie, which further nails down the surreal tone. And that's the best way to describe it. It's just a surreal atmosphere. The cemetery scenes were shot in a studio and appear dark as night. But most of the exteriors were shot during the day, so the whole movie constantly shifts from day to night. But let's talk about the flying saucers. It's been debated for years whether they're paper plates or hubcaps, but most sources say that they were plastic models from a hobby shop. They're always wobbling around and sometimes you can even see the strings. They even cast shadows on the backdrop sometimes. And the mothership looks like a pogo ball. It was shaped like a huge cigar. Uh, I don't know what kind of drugs you have to be on to see a flying saucer as a cigar. The gravestones are also pathetic. You can see the stands at the bottom, and sometimes the actors bump into them, causing them to wobble slightly, and in one instance, they actually knock them over. <laughs> Look at that. Ed Wood was so fast, he would shoot up to 30 scenes in a single day. Should have called him Fast Eddie, and rarely he would ever do a second take of anything. There's also something that maybe isn't very important at all, but I've never heard it mentioned, so I just figure I'll ask... What the hell is wrong with that fence in the background? It's like all screwed up. There's also an infamous cockpit scene. Yeah, they're supposed to be in a plane, but it's just a flat wall with a shower curtain. Supposedly one of the actors can be seen reading over the script, and there's a shadow of a boom mic which appears for a second or two. The aliens look just like regular humans, and the one behaves like a little kid. 
You see? You see? You're stupid minds. Stupid. Stupid. But what's funny is that this comes out of nowhere. It happens right after he gives this intellectual speech about how they're trying to stop the people of Earth from inventing a bomb that can destroy the whole universe. So the movie actually has an anti-war message. And for that, there is at least a lot of passion involved. Ed Wood tried his best, and he should be applauded for at least getting the movie made. So there's no way in hell it really is the worst movie of all time. I've seen plenty worse. And one thing that it is not is boring. It has an entertainment value and a cult fan base which celebrates it to this very day. It's been colorized, and there's even a remake in the works scheduled for release to coincide with its 50th anniversary. Plan 9 from Outer Space is the essential, so bad it's good movie. My rating... Fuck it, I give it four flying saucers. So check in soon for part two. We're going to talk about Ed Wood's decline and final legacy. Not to mention zombie tits. Welcome to the second and final part of Cinemassacre's Ed Woodathon, our little retrospective of Ed Wood's monster movies. Immediately following Plan 9, Ed Wood made Night of the Ghouls. It's sort of a sequel to Bride of the Monster and the third to star Paul Marco as Kelton, the reluctant cop who also appeared in Plan 9. So you can loosely call these movies a trilogy. It stars Criswell again delivering another bizarre introduction, this time rising from a coffin and his voice is heard throughout the film, giving it that same tongue-in-cheek quality as Plan 9. It also stars Tor Johnson as Lobo from his role in Bride of the Monster. The main antagonist is Dr. Acula, played by Ken Duncan. He conducts seances and charges people to speak to their dead relatives, but it's all a trick because all the ghosts are fake. And in an Ed Wood movie, if it's supposed to be fake, then it really is. But there are some great atmospheric shots of this lady in black creeping around in the woods. So yeah, real ghosts eventually turn up and go after the phony psychic or whatever he is. Overall, there's not as much to say about this movie. It's far worse than Plan 9. I mean, it's actually a more competent film. It doesn't have as many memorable bloopers, but it doesn't have the same entertainment appeal. It never gained the same sort of recognition as Plan 9, perhaps partly because it was never publicly seen until the 80s. Ed Wood could not afford the cost for the post-production house to process the negatives, so it was never released until much later. My rating? Two trumpets on a string. And of course, that's on the Ed Wood scale. Next, Ed Wood's career would take a dramatic turn in 1965. It's a zombie nudie film called Orgy of the Dead. Oh my god, what have I degenerated to giving this movie a review? It's something that has to be seen to be believed far more deserving of the title Worst Film Ever Made. It's directed by A.C. Stephen, who probably didn't use his real name for good reasons. Ed Wood was the writer, casting agent, and production manager. Even though he didn't direct it, it spells Ed Wood all over. In the beginning scene, a couple's driving on the road. The close-ups in the car are nighttime, but the outside shots of the car are broad daylight. More drastic than Plan 9, especially since it's in color. But there's so many wonderful things to write about, Bob. Sure there are, and I've tried them all. Plays, love stories, westerns, dog stories. <laughs> now there was a good one, that dog What's story. What's this guy talking about? Yeah, I write plays, love stories, westerns, dog stories. What the hell? So after a few minutes of shitty dialogue, they run the car off the road, which the POV shot relentlessly spins. So they wake up in a cemetery full of ghosts, with the leader being none other than Criswell, uttering all that strange dialogue that's become his trademark. The day is gone, the night is upon us, and the moon, which controls all of the underworld. It's also been rumored that the cape he wears is actually the same cape worn by Bela Lugosi in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. At his side is the Queen of Darkness, originally meant for Vampira, but is played by Fawn Silvers. From that point on, the whole movie is just naked dancers as Criswell watches with delight and makes funny commentary. Throw gold at her. More gold. Oh, that music is absurd. 
you might be wondering why I'm censoring a woman who seems to be fully clothed. Well, trust me. There's also a werewolf and a mummy that join the fun. Why? Well, why not? There's a scene where the werewolf howls, you can see the skin under the mask. You can also see the seams on the floor, and sometimes the fog is obviously coming from a fog machine as it comes out in sudden bursts. There's also stock footage of a rattlesnake. Again, it's in pure daylight, doesn't match anything, and it has no purpose there. But what it all boils down to, it's one of the most ridiculous movies I've ever seen. There's the Indian dance, skeleton dance, gold girl dance, cat dance, slave dance, Mexican dance, Hawaiian dance, fluff dance, zombie dance, and black ghoul dance. If you see this movie from beginning to end, you'll just ask yourself, what the fuck am I watching? I don't know what to rate this one, but if I give it anything more than one skull, I might be crazy. This was the turning point for Ed Wood. Afterwards, he made straight-up porn up until his death in 1978. He never truly got the recognition he deserved until the 1994 movie Ed Wood, directed by Tim Burton. The movies of Tim Burton have a recurring theme about outcasts. They're about rebels who don't fit in with the rest of society, whether it's Pee Wee Herman, Batman, Edward Scissorhands, or even his short film Vincent. Tim Burton is an eccentric individual, and that notion transcends onto his films. He understands his characters, so he was perfect for a biopic about Ed Wood. Johnny Depp stars as Ed Wood and is fantastic. He's both funny and sympathetic. The movie chronicles the making of Glenn or Glenda, Bride of the Monster, and Plan 9 from Outer Space. It showcases the struggles he had to go through and his persistence to get these movies made, despite the terrible odds against him. It makes fun of him as well as celebrates him, perfectly balancing the line between comedy and drama. Martin Landau plays Bela Lugosi, and he won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, rightfully so. Pull the string! Even for a big Bela Lugosi fan such as myself, I felt the need to be especially picky, but he was great. Halfway through the movie, you start to forget that he's not really Bela Lugosi, but it also comes out of character, yet hilarious, when he starts spewing curses. Fuck you! God damn, it's cold! It'll warm up once you're in it. Fuck you, you come out here! I don't have time to round up all the characters, but another favorite of mine is Mike Starr as producer George Weiss, Say who's pissed of off shit. about hey, Glenn or Glenda. that way about my movie. Your movie? I wish it was your movie. I wish I hadn't blown every dime I ever made into making this stink bomb. And if I ever see you again, I'll kill you! <laughs> The production design is brilliant. The black and white looks gorgeous. It begins with the creepy old house recreated from Bride the Monster, and then Jeffrey Jones as Criswell reenacting the introduction to Night of the Ghouls, except here he's talking about the story of Edward D. Wood Jr. Then it goes through a cemetery where the cast names are etched into gravestones, lovingly made to look fake like in Plan 9. What follows is an octopus, flying saucers, and by the way, the music is fantastic. It's one of the best opening credit scenes ever. The movie making scenes go as far to almost perfectly replicate the actual Ed Wood movies. The laboratory from Bride the Monster, the cemetery from Plan 9, it's all done with affectionate detail from the original movies. Also, it has a hauntingly effective use of musical motifs. Whenever there's a sad moment involving Lugosi, you hear Swan Lake, which was used in the opening of the original Dracula. You also sometimes hear the theme from Glenn or Glenda, which becomes the theme for Ed Wood when he's having a tender moment. It's an uplifting movie that makes you feel good in the end. It may not be a perfect factual movie, it takes some liberties to create bits of fiction, but it's mostly true to Ed Wood, and it's inspirational to anyone wanting to pursue filmmaking as their life's ambition. Ed Wood was born to make movies. Lots of people tried to stand in his way, but he fought hard to have his own creative control over his work. It playfully urges you to pursue your passions and dreams, and as Orson Welles tells Ed, visions are worth fighting for. Words of wisdom. Words of wisdom, Lloyd. Words of wisdom. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. I loved it the first time I've seen it, and I love it more each time I watch it. For my rating, I give it a perfect five Angora sweaters.
This concludes the Ed Wood Marathon. If you didn't know about Ed Wood, then I hope you found it informative. And if you're already an Ed Wood fan and already know everything I'm talking about, then I hope you enjoy. That's a wrap. Hey, Pussycat is born to be whooped. <laughs>